All right, so um, I'll get started. Thank you for the um, introduction. So um, this talk is going to be on revisiting the primitives of transaction fee mechanism design and is uh, joint work with Aditan Ganesh, who is a student at Princeton, and Clay Thomas, who is at Microsoft Research. So before getting into what are the primitives and why are we revisiting them, let me just quickly give you a brief overview of transaction fee mechanism design. This will also be relevant background uh, for the next two talks. So uh, the main question here is, how do we decide which transactions get included in a block? Um, we need to think about that problem hard because every additional bit in a block takes up space. It's a scarce resource. Everything that's being computed, that's a unit of computation that's not used somewhere else, also a scarce resource. Um, and you can't just uh, include everything you want in the blockchain. It takes, uh, takes space, it takes time, you have to prioritize. Um, even to the creator of the block, including too much stuff, um, you know, um, causes it to take longer to propagate, makes you more likely to be orphaned in longest chain protocols um, like Bitcoin or the uh, former Ethereum. So there's a cost to a lot of people involved of um, including stuff. And um, around uh, 2018, there was a paper that kind of first observed that this really is an instance of auction design. And now how we look at what was happening before then and what's currently happening in Bitcoin is that really they're just running a first price auction. So what that means is that each transaction submits a bid, which is their transaction fee. The block creator includes the highest bids, and uh, they just pay this fee to the block creator, right? So if you're a blockchain native person, you probably don't think of this as an auction. You think of this as transaction fees. If you're an auction native person, you think of this as just the first price auction. And it's natural to ask, like, should we consider using different auctions? And um, around, uh, around 2018, so I've included this quote just because uh, Vitalik came to economics and uh, computation, which is the main conference for our field, and uh, there was talking to a lot of people about um, how to redesign uh, the transaction fee mechanisms. So I highlighted that just as a flag that there is interaction between our community and um, the people who are really building this stuff. And um, at the time, there were a lot of problems, which I think um, I will skip, but um, just say the key takeaways are that A, you really need to incentivize miners to follow the protocol. That is a first order concern in the blockchain space. Um, in B, the users really want straightforward bidding. So the users were really not happy with the uh, fluctuating um, uh, fees over time. They never knew uh, how much they needed to bid to get their stuff included. And the you know, prediction algorithms were really bad at predicting because there was just so much volatility. So these were like the two key things they really, really, really wanted. Um, OK, so let me go through, since I want to introduce you to the area a little bit, let me also just kind of say, why is this not an easy problem? So if you're an, I don't know how many people in the audience are uh, auction theorists, but an auction theorist might look at this and say like, OK, easy problem. Users want straightforward bidding. Use the obvious truthful mechanism. That's a second price auction. OK, so let me just quickly say what that is. That just means that um, of, uh, you're always including the bids that submit the highest ones. And instead of charging them their bids, you, you charge them the highest bid that didn't make it in. Um, so the good news is this is truthful. So if you participate in this auction, you should just submit your bid. That's very easy. What's wrong with this is that it fails the uh, first criteria, which is the block creator is not incentivized to follow this protocol. What the block creator should do is they should look at the set of bids, and then they should insert fake bids to drive up the uh, K plus first highest price that everyone's got to pay. So here's a quick numerical example uh, if you want to follow it, but I'm not going to read through it. OK, and a second thing you might do, so maybe let me just go back. So what this highlights is that this um, constraint of you need the miner to want to follow the protocol definitely binds. And that is not always a first order constraint in classical auction design. So that's a new thing we have to think about. Another thing you might do as a classical auction designer, you say, why don't you just set a posted price? So imagine that somehow the blockchain itself can learn uh, some good price to set. And it just says, this is the price of inclusion. And uh, you can pick at most k of them. Uh, but whoever is willing to pay this price, that's the price. So I would say, again, this is nice because it's incentive compatible for the users. You either pay something bigger than P if you want to get in, pay less than P if you don't want to get in. Um, the other thing that's nice is if this is really the hard-coded protocol and there's no way for the miner to get any more revenue, they also want to implement this, right? Because the rule is uh, whatever is going on, people are going to submit bids bigger or smaller than P. If they're bigger than P, you can get P out of them. If they're less than P, there's nothing you can do to get money out of them. So that's good. Here's something that's not good about this. 
is the miner, together with the users, can collude off-chain to get around this. So the example to have in mind is what if there's a bunch of bidders who can't pay P, but they'll pay something? Then what the miner should really do is they'll get together with those bidders. They'll say, look, um, you, uh, you, know, you need to be bid uh, P on-chain to get included. That's the rule. But I'll reimburse you because I know you're not really willing to pay P. And then I'll still get some money. You'll still get some money. Uh, you'll still get on chain. Everyone's happy. So this uh, is uh, highlighting a third criteria that's really important, which is that the miner can get together with the users and just do whatever they want off chain. They don't have to have all their interactions on chain. OK, and then um, so now let me tell you what is considered, um, I think, largely considered kind of the state of the art. So this is the, uh, it's called EIP 1559 and is uh, in use in Ethereum right now. And let me tell you, I've highlighted the key parts. And then afterwards, I'm going to fill in like a couple extra details. So the key parts are that there is a fixed price P like a posted price mechanism set by the protocol, not by the miner. OK, so EIP 1559 has this estimation procedure on the blockchain to try and guess a good price. The miner picks transactions to include. And every transaction uh, that is included burns P. So what that means is that it's like a posted price mechanism to the um, bidders. To the designer, they get no revenue no matter what. OK, so what's good about this is it satisfies all the properties that we had in mind before. So for the users, it's very uh, clear what to do. And it's uh, in the very good case, the good case is that if there's less than k users that want to pay um, p, then they should just pay P if they want to be on. Don't pay P if they don't. Um, it's also incentive compatible for the miner because they're not getting any money in the first place. And also, there's no way to collude because you know if someone wants to get on chain, eventually you got to pay P. Someone's got to pay P. And there's no way between the miner and the user to collude and somehow get around that. So this is considered kind of the state of the art. And then there's like some extra details, which is like, well, what if there's more than K users who want to pay P? How are they going to get in? And um, basically, it devolves into a first price auction. I'm not going to get into uh, that part, but just wanted to give you an example. All right, so that's a quick overview of transaction fee mechanism design and sort of like why is it challenging and what's considered the state of the art. So let me now try and tell you, so that was the intro. Now I'm getting in, uh, into a little bit of detail. The details will be basic, but the rest of the talk is going to be kind of uh, detail oriented. So what's a transaction fee mechanism? So it takes as input bids from the bidders. What can the miner do? The miner can update the bids to new bids, but only in the following way. They can censor bids. So someone sent them bids. They can say, actually, I don't want to include you. And they can insert their own fake bids at the end. So they can say, now that I've seen the bids of others, I want to submit bids of my own. And they can do that after seeing the bids of the first. But that's the only thing they do. They can't change someone else's bid from five to seven. They can't do anything like that. All they can do is kick stuff out that they don't want to include, add new stuff of their own. And after doing that, there's going to be some set of included transactions. People are going to pay prices. And some of that is going to go to the miner. As we saw with the IP 1559, it doesn't have to be that the revenue is the sum of the payments. OK, and so what are the previous primitives? So there was uh, three things that were highlighted. One was that it should be a uh, dominant strategy incentive compatible for the users. Users should want to submit their true values. Two, it should be the case that the miner does not want to engage in any of these manipulations, that once the bids are fixed, the best thing for them to do is not censor, not include stuff of their own. Um, and three, collusions, including the miner, should not be able to jointly profit. OK, so those are primitives. And let me tell you, I think, the um, two interesting case studies um, that I'm just going to use those two case studies uh, to, to uh, that's just going to be thinking about those the rest of the talk. And then there's a lot more details in the paper. So here's the first case study. So think of EIP 1559 that I told you without worrying about whether there's too many bidders and there's then going to be this first price auction that kicks in. Think of there as just being unlimited supply. Anyone who wants to pay P can get in, and that's it. And it's burned. And there's a price set by the protocol. Anyone who wants to pay P can get in. You pay P, it's burned. The miner gets nothing. And we said, this is great because users should just bid their true value. Miners are not getting any revenue no matter what they do. Um, so they should just participate honestly. And there's no collusions here. So this is one. And I would say this is, uh, I, is my understanding, I would say, is currently considered kind of like the gold standard, except for 
unlimited supply, which is not realistic. But otherwise, we look at the properties we have and we say, this is great. It satisfies everything we want. And another one that I learned about actually at this conference last year um, when I was talking with Elaine at lunch is the cryptographic second price auction. So imagine you have access to enough multi-party computation technology to run quickly. Then what you could do is you could have this bid vector B be encrypted. And so while technically the miner can see B before deciding whether they want to you know, censor anything or submit fake bids, they have no idea what's actually in there because everything's encrypted. Other than that, it's just a second price auction. And um, so here, this is dominant strategy incentive compatible because it's a second price auction. And uh, what I was re uh, really surprised to learn from Elaine last year is it's actually not um, myopic minor incentive compatible. So the miner does not want to follow the protocol. And I first was thinking, like, how can that be? Everything is encrypted. What does the miner want to do? And it turns out that if we stare at the definitions, it's because the miner does want to set a reserve. When you're running a second price auction, you increase your revenue by setting a reserve, even if you don't know the bids. And the way that the problem is phrased, that's not, you know, the miner can't do that because there's just a mechanism. And so what the miner would have to do is they would have to insert a fake bid to act as the reserve. Okay, so this is uh, considered not the gold standard because it doesn't satisfy those definitions. Um, and then kind of like the main result in this area um, was worked on um, by Elaine Ka and uh, Hao, um, which shows that um, we do know that even with cryptography, there's still like a strong impossibility here that says with limited supply, we don't have the gold standard because you just can't satisfy all the properties we want. Okay, so what are the main points I want to make? And then it looks like I'll have time to get into uh, one or two of them. So one of the main points I think of our paper is that I don't think EIP-1559 in the unlimited supply setting should be thought of as the gold standard. So I think there is a, um, I do think there is an issue with it that is just not captured by the existing definitions. And so I would say the first point I really want to make is that there is a new thing we really should be thinking about when designing these things that was not captured by previous definitions. Uh, the second main point is that I do think the cryptographic second price auction really is good. And I agree that it does not satisfy MMIC, the previous definitions. I think we should redo the definitions because I do think that um, a miner being able to see only encrypted bids does not, to me, sound like the miner can do anything malicious. And I really think we should rethink that definition. And the uh, minor thing we think about is it may be OCA proof and these previous collusion resistance definitions are too strong. We propose a weaker alternative, but I think I'm definitely not going to get into that. So I think with um, two minutes, I will try to get uh, at least this point across. Um, so what I want to ask is maybe spend the 15 seconds it'll take me to read this thinking. If you were the miner, so if you're an auctioneer, and you're participating in EIP 1559, and the rule is no matter what is included on chain, you get nothing, right? So that is the protocol. That's hard coded. You will never get any payment on chain. What would you do? Um, so I'm claiming you would definitely deviate. I would definitely deviate from the intended protocol, but it's not captured by the existing model and it's not something I can do on chain. So what I would do is I would just publicly announce to everyone I absolutely refuse to include any bids unless you pay me $10 off chain. Or, you know, not necessarily 10, but some number. So I would just say that. And what I would do is I would realize that the items I'm selling are the right to be, you know, forwarded by me to the blockchain protocol. I would recognize that I'm a monopolist, and I would just set a monopoly price on that item. And that would guarantee me some revenue. Even if everyone ignores me, I'm no worse off. But if anyone pays me anything, I'm strictly better off than following the protocol. So, um, so I think that this is really what I would do. And I think that this really should be modeled as something we care about in the desiderata. So that I would say is like main point number one. And let me very quickly try and say main point number two is um, I think the problem, or one of the problems with the previous definitions is that it doesn't let the miner provide any input. And so what you should have in mind is that really the miner is a sophisticated you know, like builder in a, you know, who does DeFi all the time. They're going to have some Bayesian prior over what's the right reserve to set in a second price auction. If you hard code the second price auction with no reserve on chain, 
they're gonna be like, come on, can you just let me set a reserve? Can you let me optimize the way I like to optimize? And you really should just give them the option to do that and not consider it like they have to set a certain reserve or they have to follow a specific protocol. You should uh, include that flexibility. So, all right, so I think I'm out of time. So what I wanna do is very quickly um, flash up on the screen. The only change, like there's uh, two main changes I wanna make. One is I wanna explicitly model a miner with a Bayesian prior. Two, I wanna let the miner do something to reflect the fact that they have a prior that's probably better informed than whatever you can compute on chain in a protocol. And then uh, we have, yeah, so I guess I won't get to state the definitions, but um, uh, if your question is, I would like to see the definitions, then I will go back um, during the Q&A period. Um, but let me, so conclusions are, I would say uh, one thing is we propose relaxing MMIC so that cryptographic second price auction, I really think should be considered good. Another one is we propose a new desideratum that I really think mechanism should satisfy. And so that makes the constraints harder to satisfy. Um, and in terms of future work, um, I do think we should continue thinking really hard about what TFM should be doing. Um, I think it's really important to like study the crap out of the core setting that we've been doing so far. So that's what this paper is doing. I believe that's what the next two papers in the session are doing. Um, it is also important to understand how MEV messes everything up, and you know none of these papers are really explaining what happens with MEV. Um, but I think we really got to understand the core setting all the way first, um, and I think we're still not quite there. So I think there's a bit uh, left to do. Um, so that's it, and uh, I'll now take questions. that. Great. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, so, so one of the things that, that you mentioned with this sort of, uh, you know, uh, if the miner isn't getting rewarded for including transactions in any way, then they have an incentive to demand something off chain. It seems like fundamentally the only way to fix that is to provide them some reward somehow for including transactions. But that seems also fundamentally at odds with the no profitable collusion uh, requirement. Yeah. Right, because as soon as the miner's getting rewarded, then at some level, it might be a very small level, they could, there could be profitable collusion to include a transaction that wasn't otherwise gonna yep. be there. I agree, so let me, let me flip to, let me see if I can find my uh, quick slide on collusion. Um, okay, so, uh, so I would actually propose that I think we should also revisit how we think of collusion. So I think, um, Basically, here's what I would say. If you are primarily concerned about um, actually the miner also being a bidder, so imagine you think that the top builders, they are both builders and they are doing transactions, you really do want the existing definitions. You, re you really want that because they know their value, they know the values of everyone, they really want that. If that's not what you're concerned about, you're concerned about a builder getting together with a bunch of bidders, then I would say like, okay, why are you giving the colluders this insane power that you say, okay, they know each other's values, they're gonna somehow negotiate perfectly and agree on a price. So that, like we say, that's not how mechanism design works. I don't know mm -hmm. why that's, we would say like that's how collusion works. So I would right. say, you know what, maybe we should view collusion the same way that we view mechanism design. We I should see. say that the, um, uh, the, sell, the seller has a Bayesian prior over what the people they're colluding with uh, you know, are gonna bid. The seller is gonna collude with them. They're gonna find some Bayes-Nash equilibrium. And then it turns out that you know, they're, they're like the cryptographic second price auction is one example where you actually can't do better with that form of, it is robust to that form of collusion. So in order for the cryptographic second price auction to be manipulable by collusion, you would have to really like know other people's values because you have to figure out how you're gonna split. And so say for example, we decided, oh, you're gonna overbid for me in a second price auction, that's gonna get us jointly more money, um, and I'm gonna give you some kind of kickback. Mm -hmm. You say, well, I have to decide what's actually the mechanism by which I give you a kickback. And that's gonna depend on your value, and then I want that to yeah. not be manipulable yeah. and all of that. Right, and I see. Yeah. So basically, the, 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 your, your suggestion is, is essentially resolve this tension by 
weakening, it's also going to presumably end up complicating, but weakening the definition of collusion yeah. to something that, that is sort of more realistic. Yeah, so yes, cool. I would say that that's a short answer. And yep. just to be clear, I'm not saying you never want the stronger form. Sure. But I'm saying that I think we should have a language to describe when you get something but not the super, super, super strong thing, especially because we know from like all the impossibility results, like you just can't get the super, super strong thing. Right. Um, and it's exactly what you described as their impossibility. It says basically with collusion, you can't get any revenue. So Got we it. need to find some way to get yeah. around that. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So a uh, question about the you know minor in this model. So it sounds like you have one minor that kind of limits how the minor can be disciplined. So I was just wondering if you thought at all about, you know, can you design mechanisms that incentivize more truthful reporting by minors if you have, you know, multiple minors who can point out when another minor has done something fishy? Yeah, good question. So I think, um, so I would interpret this as sort of like, if the block building is done by a single entity, which is how it's currently done in all the protocols I'm aware of, think of the minor as kind of like a gatekeeper to what information gets in. You can still have all sorts of complicated stuff that happens afterwards. But the miner's a gatekeeper to what gets in in this block, and we are definitely viewing them as kind of like a monopolist. Now, if you wanted to look, so definitely, um, I think I 100% agree with the premise that if you're willing to look kind of like multiple blocks in the future and say like, well, next round, there's going to be some other miner, that miner could um, you know, include some things that maybe claimed they were eligible to be included here and, and stuff like that. So I think uh, definitely if you were willing to explicitly model that and think about, like, I do think there's something you, I, there's definitely something you could do there. Um, I don't have a great idea on whether there's something clean you could do there or, like, what are the right assumptions, but I do think that's a very natural direction to look to try and get around some of the impossibilities here, too. I, I agree with that premise. Yeah, right. I mean, it occurs to me because it's like, you know, slashing or something, right? Yeah, so it'd be tricky, but you need to, you just need to be very careful, like, what exactly is the slashable offense? Because you don't yeah, want to right, say no. not including something is a slashable offense, because mm -hmm. then it'd be like, well, what if you didn't hear about it? Um, you could find other, like, you could find other things, like, including, I don't know, like, like I think, it, like, the slashing is tricky, because you would need to somehow prove that the minor, um, or, yeah, sorry, or you could just decide that you're going to sometimes punish honest minors who got unlucky. Um, that's always an option. Um, but I think short of doing something like that, it's tricky because you would need to say, like all the miner can do is censor stuff. And so you would need to prove that they saw something when they're claiming they didn't. Or uh, they can insert their own bids. So you would need to like prove that, the mine, that those are really bids of the same miner and not just actual fake bids. So I think for something like slashing, you would either need to accept that you're gonna sometimes hit honest miners, or you would have to somehow prove these things that seem very hard to prove. I think so. The model is. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I don't know if that makes oh. sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs>